Hello, friends, and welcome to the Optimized Advisor Podcast, where we focus on optimizing the well-being and best practices of insurance and financial professionals today. On this show, our objective is to help you optimize your life, optimize your profession, and learn from other optimized advisors. I'm your host, Scott Heinela. We hope you enjoy the show. On today's show, I was enlightened by guest Jeff Henley, CFP. Jeff has 20 years of experience in personal financial and insurance planning. He is co-founder and currently leads Platinum Wealth Management Group, which is a financial and insurance planning firm. He is also the co-founder and lead instructor of Advanced Planning Educational Group. We dive into both of those, what they are, and his role today. Jeff also serves as the managing member of Simplified Tax Solutions, which is the CPA and tax planning firm within his local community. And he's also an instructor at Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan, where he teaches various financial and estate planning courses in the postgraduate certification program. We do dive into a little bit how he gets all this done, which is also quite interesting. Uh, Throughout his career, Jeff has lectured at hundreds of clients' events, led several private courses at financial firms, and has been invited to speak at various professional conferences, including the annual conference of the Michigan Society of CPAs, the Estate Planners Day Conference of the Estate Planning Council of New York City, as well as many, many more. We hope you enjoy today's discussion with Optimized Advisor, Jeff Henley. Jeff Henley, President and Co-Founder of Platinum Wealth Management Group. Welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here with you, Scott. My man. It's good to see you. I wish you were here in person. Oh, later this year. I'm all ready to fly. I am good. COVID is over. Time to travel. September, right? We will be doing one. I've got us planned to be there. I'm going to be in Southern California that uh, last week in September. Spending half the week with you and a little time at risk allies. Coming from your house today, Western Michigan. Yep. Right? Your view of the lake. Right over my screen right now, I'm looking at Lake Michigan. That's a so, beautiful thing. Yes, it is. A, it's, I'm a very fortunate person. I've had a fortunate life. And, you know, if, if you've never been to the Great Lakes, it's an incredible sight. I There's a few places I have in order to go on my list. One is out in the West, Northwest is Bend, Oregon, never been, need to go. The other is the Western, Northern, Northern Michigan, you know, uh, on Lake Michigan, Traverse City and all that. It's uh, here. It's just absolutely epic and it's on my list. So sooner than later, I need to get my hiney up there. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll make, I'll make space for you and your family. You should come up and spend a week on the beach. I look forward to that. So sincerely, thank you for taking time with us today to talk a little bit about Jeff Henley, you, your practice, your history, your your challenges, successes within within your practice and your journey in, in financial planning and wealth management. As I stated, you are president and co-founder of Platinum Wealth Management Group. Tell me a little bit about your journey to get to kind of where you are you are today. Oh uh, well, it's, it's, you it's fall into this crazy world we call financial services. Well, it's uh, it's it's definitely an interesting story. I finished um, when I finished my undergraduate degree, I took a job as a uh, with a, an auto dealer group as a finance and insurance manager, and I really enjoyed that. I moved my way up through there. I learned a lot about um, what selling commodities was all about, working for an automotive dealer group, and and how important it is to be a great communicator there. And then um. I, I realized I wanted to have a family and uh, working 70, 80 hours a week in uh, automotive, the automotive industry was just not conducive to having a family. So uh, I had an opportunity to interview with a large insurance agency uh, in Southeast Michigan. At the, well, at the time it was a smaller insurance agency and they were all, fo- they were primarily focused around um, safe money and they did a lot with annuities. They did a lot with insurance, life insurance. And so I took a role with them. Uh, 22 years ago, almost 22 years ago. And um, so uh, 1980, 81. <laughs> right. well, we'll, 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 well, how about we go with about 2000? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I was checking to see if you were paying attention. Oh, yeah. 80, 81. No, I was still watching Knight Rider and, <laughs> uh, in junior high at the time. And yes, I was a nerd. If you want to talk about my journey, I was the absolute nerd in high school. I spent more time in a locker than I spend out of a locker. So <laughs> We're, we got to have a little fun, right? 
Yeah, Scott was a cool. I know Scott was a cool kid in high school, the kind of kid that would put me in the locker. But <laughs> I, I would not say that. Absolutely not. But but I yeah. You know, look, I was born and raised here in Southern California, and uh, surfing, skating, and all that quote unquote cool stuff was inbred in us, if you will. Yeah. And so while you were living the life of 90210, <laughs> I, I was I was living in, uh, I grew up in Gross Point, Michigan. So we didn't quite have all the cool stuff to do. I mean, our summer's only three weeks long anyway. But um, you know, I, I took a job with this insurance agency and um, I started working with clients. And I will say that one of the scariest things, and I remember vividly was my first day of working with new with appointments and walking out to meet a client for the very first time. And I was terrified they might know something more than I did. And I, I figured they would know more than I did because uh, even though I had an education with uh, some post-grad work in finance, it wasn't financial planning. So I worked there for, I, I spent some time in the field and I moved up into management and then executive management with that insurance agency and helped grow it from 20 people to a couple hundred people. And we did a lot of recruiting and training and development and it was a lot of work. And then I was back to working 78 hours a week. And it wasn't, again, conducive to having a family. So I made the decision with um, my with a person I was working with there who was a, a, a friend of mine from college. And, and my brother was working with me at the insurance agency as well, that we were ready to go on our own. We wanted to branch beyond the, just the sale of annuities and life insurance. And we wanted to move into more comprehensive financial planning. And where we were at was really not conducive to that. So we went ahead and started Platinum Wealth Management Group on uh, August 15th, 2007. It's one of those things you remember the date of birth of your company, just mm -hmm. like you with your kids. And it's and every year we celebrate. But ever since then, um, I've been working in the financial planning space uh, with our own firm. And we've grown a little bit, not we not because we recruited. It's because people would, would hear of us and, and ask to join. And uh, we were very scrutinous. And now we have eight planners under our branch and we um, we offer everything from comprehensive planning to assets under management to still do a lot with index and life insurance, a lot with hybrid life. And um, and of course, retail brokerage accounts. And, uh, and, and most importantly, newest of all, is we're doing a lot of actual fee-based financial planning where we're charging a fee for financial planning. And that's kind of the, been the growth of our practice over the last uh, 13 years or so. So it's a, it's an interesting journey, but I know it, it, many of the people in the industry share the same journey I've walked. Yeah, absolutely. So when did you realize or what made you realize that there's more to offer or that I want more to offer my clients than just insurance solutions and, and really embracing the CFP education and any other of the other educational credentials that you've obtained? You know, I when I did when I was working for the insurance agency, we did annuities. My position was very clear. I didn't I didn't disbelieve in assets under management. I didn't disbelieve in the market positions. I believed in all of that. I just knew where the portion of a of a client's assets I would what I would be responsible for. Mm -hmm. And I knew the portion I did, and, and and frankly, the the organization I was with did it really really well. And and um, as a matter of fact, um, I still to this day lean more towards the insurance side of things because I believe in protected income. But what I realized was, is as I was doing the planning for the annuities, as I was doing the planning for the life insurance piece, I was studying the entire portfolio. I was developing plans, looking at the whole scenario, spending all the time, spending all the effort and only doing one piece of the puzzle. And I realized that the clients were getting split approaches to planning. They, they were getting their investment advice from the person who was still handing their at-risk assets and they were getting their safe advice from me. And, and there was there was two chefs in the kitchen trying to stir the same pot and it wasn't working out. So I realized if I was really going to serve the clients well, then I needed to create a central point for that client, for the families I served. And that was the birth and the genesis of my desire to start uh, Platinum. Was, yeah, so that was in 2007, right? Yep. And you did not have a designation at that point your name I, went so and i'm i'm just you're very curious to get your kind of perspective on not just having the letters behind your name that's the obvious benefit we can all see that but what did you gain from some of these these designations that you've obtained and i would say you've you've earned them in pretty short order relatively speaking right, right. um 
so is there any insights that you can provide as it relates to education, to designations, uh, good, bad? Absolutely. Um, I got my, I, a couple of years into the business, I started to study for my CRPC, uh, the Charter Retirement Planning Counselor from the College for Financial Planning out of Denver. I started to study for it. I spent some time on it. But back then, it was a fairly thin designation as far as the effort it took to get. It mm -hmm. was 13 books, but each book, you know, was kind of like see Dick and Vass, see, see Jane run. You know, it was a it was a much simpler designation. But right. what it did is it what I really struggled with was I had been learning. I'm a lifelong learner and I kept learning from the Internet. I'd go to Google and I'd Google a topic and I'd learn something about estate planning. I'd learn something about uh, risk management, but there was it didn't seem like there was any comprehensive education that was all tied together. So I before I left. Financial Service America, I had I had taken one class towards the CFP because a friend of mine was teaching it. And so I stepped into one class and that's when it I lit up that it's not so much the letters. The letters are incredible to have next to your name because my business skyrocketed um, with the size of the clients I was dealing with and the, and the, and the scope of service I was offering. And I was, I was getting into much more lucrative households and with significant, significantly more resources once I had the CFP next to my name. But studying for it, it's a command of the knowledge that you know nothing was out of reach any longer. And, right. and you had to get that through a formal setting and the CFP was great. Um, now I teach at Oakland University. I'm the, the lead professor in the CFP curriculum. Now, it, it, the same, that's my, my alma mater for where I got my CFP designation from in the first place. But I will say that the, the CFP designation out of all of them was by far the most valuable. It taught the most information. It was involved. It's it's truly intense. The examination process is is difficult. Um, but when I finished with it, and you can hold a client event, and I was holding client seminars to attract new business, and you'd say, I'm a certified financial planner. How many of you work with a CFP now? And I would give this whole speech about, you know, less than 20% of the marketplace are certified financial planner designees. And it really lit up. And I would say that my reschedule rate from events like that skyrocket. And then I got involved with the Estate Planning Council of Detroit. And that's where I, I, I started to work with the national organization. And that's where I got my uh, accredited estate planner, which is nice because of a cornerstone of my practice is estate planning. And so having that is really nice when I'm coordinating with the attorneys and they recognize that I have a background in estate planning as well as financial planning. So I believe in designations. I think that there's great designations. The RICP is spectacular when you're dealing with income planning that's done by the American college. I also think the CHFC is a, is a really great designation. That's a counterpart to the CFP. And in some cases, a furtherance of the CFP. So I think there's some great stuff there. So I, I believe in it. it it's not necessarily the letters, it's the education, but the letters do help during business development. How has the CFP, I'm just curious, the curriculum changed over the years since you obtained it to what it currently looks like now and in particular the exam? Well, it's, it's, it's gotten easier in some ways and more difficult than others. The five courses, when I took it, there were five courses and that were, you know, your estate planning, your income planning, your investment planning, your risk management. Now they've added a capstone course and kind of a fundamentals course. And just as of recent, they've gotten heavily involved in behavioral science. And as a matter of fact, many CFP curriculums are being launched by universities from the liberal arts area, especially in psychology, as opposed to the business schools. Mm. So they're starting to recognize that the education that we as financial planners need to uh, complete really helps us understand the psychology of investing, the psychology of not selling out after the market plummeted and rebuying after your shirt's going to go up and you buy at the top. It's really about helping the client stay disciplined and working towards their goal. The um, curriculum also upped its game by having a capstone course where now you got to complete a financial plan. And that has had a little layer of difficulty to the, to the educational piece because obviously you've got uh, one more class to get through right. and complete a plan. But the examination has changed dramatically. Now, the examination, when I took the exam, was a two-day exam. And I remember I was at Cobo Hall, downtown Detroit, which is our, one of our biggest um, uh, venues for conferences and shows. And so we were on the lowest level. And on the level directly above it was a national cheerleading competition. 
So oh, imagine taking your CFP exam where every song you're listening to above you is Hey Mickey. <laughs> 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 oh, and, that's fantastic. So every that's time I hear Hey Mickey, I have flashbacks to the CFP exam and I start to quiver. Um, but back sure. then we had we had story problems, we had ans we had short answers, we had a lot of calculator problems that were had to be done by hand. Now the exam is very much like a series seven exam where it's done by Prometric. You go and you take the exam, it's done in eight hours and you're over. So yeah. it's it's more it's a little bit so the eight planners that you currently have now, is there a protocol within your practice that they have a educational curriculum they have to follow and abide by? Yep, absolutely. And um, that includes? See, well, for starters, everyone has to, to be licensed for securities, of course, because we want to make sure that we can look at a client and say, we've got the ability to offer you advice on a fee basis using a 65 or 66, or we can do retail accounts using a Series 7. That's a mandatory item. I also want to see uh, the CFP out of all my planners. I, I believe that it carries weight when I can say that everybody's a, either a CFP and I've got one that chose to go the route of AIF. Um, uh, and so, but the CFP really bring, brings credibility to the organization as a whole because yeah. clients know that when we transition, because we built the succession plan in, that even our successors are ready to go. Yeah. So, so when you started uh, the, the Platinum Wealth Management back in 2007, it was you and your brother? And my and my best friend from college, Don Denstad. Okay, and Don, yep. your brother's name again for Greg, everybody. Yeah. It's Craig. Craig. So it's you, Craig, and Don. Yep, Gregory, as in G. Gregory. Yeah. How did you? What was your marketing engine at that time? <laughs> and has that changed over the years? Uh, it's evolved, but, okay. but when we when we started off, um, we had non compete, non solicit agreements from our old insurance agency. Uh, the three of us combined had 1,045 clients at the insurance agency, and we honored our commitments. We we agreed to it. But fortunately, because I had worked so hard for the organization, and so did Don and Greg, we were granted a little bit of latitude where we were given a small number of clients that we could retain the relationship. And we negotiated for that. I traded my stock options and everything for it. And so we started our firm with four dozen clients total. And we had to grow an entire practice and cover the overhead. So our first uh, our first w approach was to go what we'd already been doing before, and that was to hold lunchtime seminars. And um, so we would hold um, topical events. We would do the postcard mailing. We'd bring them in for lunch. We'd lecture for typically about 90 minutes. And um, we didn't use any canned material. We used our own developed material. And so we would say, what are the top six mistakes somebody would make? Or, you know, what are the secret, what's the secret success in, in a well-designed estate plan? We would do our own topics. And as a result, there was no product pitch made in the event. There was no, um, nothing but, you know, this is the caliber we are. We'd like to get to know you further. And we drove up our success rate where we were seeing typically about 60% of the people that would attend the event would come and sit for an appointment afterwards. And, and we only did it in our office. We didn't, we didn't go to homes. We didn't meet at kitchen tables. We did our office and we we held about 60 percent uh and then once we got our cfps that number went up to about 80 percent and we kept doing and to this day we kept doing it now what's changed and um i don't want to belabor it but i'd like to share this experience because it was kind of interesting when COVID hit yeah uh, we, had, we had already slowed our marketing down because we had reached a point where we at over the course of a dozen years, we had kind of saturated our book of business and we were basically closed to new clients. We'd hold three or four client events a year simply to replace the clients that we lost to death or they moved out of market. Right, now you were in. Yep, and, and so we, we would do that. So we only held three or four events a year, but we knew during the COVID year, we weren't gonna be doing that. And we started to find out, and this is something we can talk about a little bit about fee-based planning is we started to get more and more referrals and we had people say, I, I've got a friend that wants to learn more about you, but they just don't want to come in for an appointment just yet. We, and we in the financial service have all heard that statement. Yeah. So we developed for 2020 an online seminar series where we would share it with our clients and let them share the link with their friends to just join in. And we would hit a topic that was, you know, very current events. And we actually got people that would attend uh, as a referral. And that that proved to be very effective. At These were live events? Live, just like we're doing here now on the podcast. We'd be live. We would bring in 
Um, I'd either cover the event topic if it was in my wheelbase, or we'd bring in an outside speaker. Because doing it virtually, I was no longer geographically bound to somebody in Detroit. So I might bring in an outside speaker. Um, for example, we did a year-end tax planning where I brought in my colleague and partner in my education firm, Ruth Rafter, and she did a year-end client tax planning event, which I'm not licensed to really do as not as not being a CPA. And we had a lot of clients and their friends show up. And it just proved to be a great way. There was no cost involved. And it was non-threatening, non, you know, to bring a friend and they can come and go as they please. And, and it created an opportunity. And then the first time appointments that followed were all virtual. And so it created a whole new way of doing business. And well, the marketing for that was specifically to your existing database with their with a suggestion to forward this, share this with whoever you'd feel for would benefit from attending as well. Absolutely. That's all we did. Wow. So you did not employ a third party company to help the marketing aspect of that. You just work oh. off your database. So what's your, are you using, what's your, your CRM? Is it Salesforce, Redtail? Redtail. Red yeah. Redtail. Okay. Yeah. So we just use our existing and it was, it was a multi-pronged approach. I mean, we'd email them and let them know it's coming up. We built a little um, PDF flyer and it turned it into a JPEG image. So it would pop onto an Outlook email. We didn't even use MailChimp. We just sent it out that way. And then we followed up with a courtesy call to our clients and just said, hey, just want to let you know this is going on. Did you have any friends you'd like to invite? Did that? Did the attendance start out small and, and work its way up as it became more steady and consistent? Or was it, what, what has the attendance looked like since you've been doing them? Well, we did half a dozen at the tail end of last year. We suspended for the beginning of this year because we're actually a little overwhelmed with new business right now, which is a, not a bad problem. But since the COVID has freed us up a little bit, things are moving a little bit faster. Um, the tenants started off pretty strong right out of the get-go. We, wow. we The very first topic we picked was something that was hot in Michigan. Um, last fall, Michigan engaged a new personal injury protection law for our car insurance that changed things. We were, we were the only state in the union that had unlimited personal injury protection as a mandate. And they changed it where you could go to a reduced amount, but nobody knew what they should elect. So we brought in uh, a PNC agent to mm. talk about what are my options and what are the risks associated with each election. And people were just, nobody knew how to respond and nobody knew the risks. And we brought that in and it just took off. And then it kind of built, uh, the year end tax planning was very well attended. Um, we did one on hybrid life that was well attended. So it's just kind of an interesting thing. It's just the topic has to be interesting. Yeah. And it's gotta be current. That's great. So you started out with 48 clients in 2007 that you were able to negotiate. What do you look at? What's Platinum Wealth have as a client base today? In total, well, one of our reps is outboard. She is not in the office, so I won't count any of her clients in there. But in total, we have about 800. 800 clients. Okay. Yep. And and we believe that ideally, when you're doing comprehensive planning and you are doing the, the life insurance work, the hybrid work, the long-term care insurance piece, you're doing the income planning, you're doing the investments. We always like to think about 125 per advisor is a good number. Per advisor, 125. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of comprehensive financial planning, such a, a, a term that's used anecdotally and what does that really mean? For you in your practice, financial planning begins with an estate plan. Yep. As opposed to let's tackle the investment portfolio right now and get that done and out of the way. So let's talk a little bit about that. Why? Well, in the end, um, I teach estate planning, so that was that was the the wrong reason to start there. <laughs> um, but the, what I have learned through day one in my career is the insurance agency I was with also had a partnership with an estate planning attorney. And we found one of the most underaddressed issues in a family's uh, circumstances were that they had never really done an estate plan. They, they're stalked on a daily basis by financial professionals. You know, the newest idea, the newest mutual fund, the newest investment, the newest annuity. That happens to families every day. But they really don't have an outlet to set up an estate plan. And a lot of times they have questions. So we found that by educating families, and I found that by educating them, on what is the difference between a will and a trust? What is a power of attorney for financial decisions? Why do you got to keep it updated? Why does it go stay after five years? We just would spend a little time educating them. And the clients viewed that as um, my ability to address the whole picture. And it earned me relationships right from the get-go. But then 
after getting involved, I kept wondering, why did I have stronger penetration into every relationship with, that we had? Why was I getting deeper and why was I capturing more assets? Because statistically, the math says that um, a family pre-retirement typically has three financial advisors they're getting input from. And one of them may be a professional at the bank. But I had... I didn't, I didn't believe that statistic because I was the only financial advisor in my client's table. I'm like, why don't I have any competition? And I realized I was transferring accounts over from two or three other people, but I was the only one left. And it's because when you start with estate planning and you get the lay of the land in the family and you learn that their daughter may be going through a divorce or they don't like their son-in-law, or you learn that they have some circumstances with their, their son that just is, is a failure to launch. Once you learn what makes people tick and what matters and you tie every investment insurance tax idea every one of them to a family member's name you're really getting your clients and when you read the studies every study has indicated that rate of return is usually third or lower on the list of priority for most clients and the reason it falls so low is because number one is always does my planner understand me do they get me do they know what really matters to me? And when you start with estate planning and you get the lay of the land, the family, we all love our families. And that's why we do what we do is we take care of our families. And once you put your family first and you put the client's family first, it just made sense. That's why I start with estate planning. Now, with that, I would think that 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 process, beginning with an estate plan and the estate planning uh, process altogether, also open up a natural introduction or a transition to the next generation in your practice through natural attrition how has that you know resonated or validated itself within the practice cuz that's a challenge for a lot of advisors is i i, I have client you know mr and mrs G a boomer and uh they pass away or something happens to them and then now I don't really have a relationship with the advisor. And all of a sudden those, those assets do what out the back door. And it's, it's, it's funny. That, that's a great question. Thanks for asking them, Scott, because um, remember the TV show, Char you remember the cartoon, Charlie Brown? And, oh yeah. And he's got that yellow shirt on with a little zigzag black stripe on it. Yes, sir. And I still relate it to Charlie Brown. I really felt like Charlie Brown growing up. <laughs> <laughs> um, just nobody called me blockhead on a regular basis, but, uh, what what I always like to think of is Charlie Brown's shirt in business development ways. And the reason is, is let's say you work with a client, Mr. And Mrs. Boomer or Mr. and Mrs. Greatest Gen. And you got them at the top of one of Charlie Brown's peaks on his shirt. Mm -hmm. If you start with estate planning and you say, hey, you know, through through the through the, the process of getting to the family, you uncover that there's a special needs grandchild, or maybe there's a grandchild with a learning disability that's really that really will never be able to command a strong income you can say, all right, well, here's one of the things I'd like to bring in a special needs attorney and let's talk about setting up a special needs trust. Let's fund it to a second to die insurance policy, which is economical. But you know what? One of the things that's probably going to be important in that discussion is your daughter's input. So why don't we include your daughter in your estate planning process? So it's there. Or we always would suggest, you know, if, if we're dealing with um, forward thinking tax planning, generational tax planning, you know, you've got a million and a half in IRAs. We know that your kids are professionals. They're all successful. How about we begin to coordinate with their tax strategies and their investments before we do maybe a Roth conversions multi-year strategy with you? If you'd like to include them on a Zoom meeting, maybe we could cover that and make sure it's there. And what's happened is when we do those, in almost every circumstance, we end up picking the kids up as clients. So when mom and dad do pass, the money doesn't transition from a client to an unknown, it transitions from client to client. And it's that including the kids in the estate planning process and the multi-generational tax planning that brings them in the loop. It, it you know, oftentimes uh, the kids have never done estate planning themselves. And so like, oh, I need to do that too. And so you demonstrate success right then and there. And then also what we do is we do multi-generational insurance planning to include the kids. Um, maybe we got the parents that have successful kids and you'd start talking about a little bit of a wealth transfer plan. And one wealth transfer technique in estate planning would be set up an island. Let's go set up that irrevocable life insurance trust. Let's, let's insure you, Mr. Boomer, we'll insure you and we'll pay the premiums to the trustee and the trustee will, you know, will then send out the crummy notes and eventually 
remit the, pay, the premiums to the insurance company. Well, we actually took a different tact. And we said in the wealth transfer, I know you want to give your kids money. We want to give them, you know, the maximum that we can give using the annual exclusion. We want to give them, you know, 10, 20,000. We want to leave some room there for, you know, social gifts and fun gifts. But what if you could help them with their own retirement plans? What if we were to look at a whole life insurance policy or an IUL that had built up cash value, but instead of listing you as the insured, what if we list them as the insured? And what if we use them as, and we'll, and you give them the money and they pay the premium. And then later we develop a withdrawal strategy, a tax-free revenue strategy out of that life insurance policy. And what happened was mom and dad loved the idea of giving purposeful gifts. They loved the idea of giving gifts that did something other than buy a granite counter. Mm -hmm. And so when they were giving these gifts to the kids for the insurance policies, why we're doing the insurance policies, we're also exploring that relationship. And many times the kids would say, yeah, mom's giving me five grand a premium. I'm 26. You know, that's going to buy me, you know, $40,000 of tax-free revenue from 65 to 95 later in life. What if I put five grand of my own money in? And so we would find that the kids would augment mom and dad's gifts in the very same plans we were setting up. Hmm. And so it was using estate planning and gifting under estate planning and wealth transferring in a wealth transference discussion that really went a long way. And that did Charlie Brown share us and we brought, we went right in. Wow. That's great insights. Thank you for sharing that. You know, it's interesting. Sometimes the tendency is to, to think that I need a very sophisticated plan through developing a certain type of a trust or what have you. And there, there, there's pros and cons to any financial decision that I make, pretty much any decision I make in life. But in that, in that example, so the adult child is the owner and the insured on their own policy. It's just being gifted from the parents to fund the policy. And it's a much simpler way to go yep. if, if the need is there. And, and it's a great way to transfer wealth. It also builds a pretty substantial death benefit because the parents now feel good because they're looking at their grandkids and their son-in-law or daughter-in-laws. And they're thinking to themselves, if something happens to my kid, I know they're underinsured. So it, it even solves that problem. So you got dual purpose. Yeah. And you can even add the hybrid feature for, you know, if the kids are old enough. But instead of trying to insure a 70-year-old, insure a 30-year-old. They're a lot easier to write insurance and the premiums go so much further. Yeah, absolutely. What other taxes are just, you know, front and center today? What about different strategies that your firm is looking at and, and utilizing, whether that be you know, harvesting of IRAs to Roths or you know, backdoor IRA strategies or just looking at or or unique planning strategies that your firm is implementing now, uh, not just asset classes, but the taxation of individual assets that our clients have? Well, uh, the first things uh, that we do that right after we do estate planning and we have all the data of the family and we have the anticipated tax brackets of the kids. Now we start to do three layers of tax planning with the clients. We look at mitigating tax exposure, First and easiest thing to look for, especially if they're of RMD age, is have you been have you been taking advantage of a QCD? And you can simply look down and say, do you give money to charity every year? Yes, great. You see an RMD on the 1040? Um, you know, immediately, how much of how much of that dollar do you give to a charity? Let's get that off to a charity using a QCD. And by the way, that opens up headroom on your tax bracket for us to or do things like Roth conversions. So then we would explain the merits of doing a Roth conversion. And right now, with the tax laws the way they are, with the expiration of the TCJA in 2025, we are doing substantial Roth conversions. I'm talking two, three hundred thousand dollars a year in Roth conversions. We're burning through many of the lower brackets because they'll never exist again. And their counterparts post TCJA are going to be very uncomfortable. So we're we're doing significant Roth conversions, but we don't just stop with the idea of doing a Roth conversion. Because in the old days, pre-secure, we would the Roth conversion made a lot of sense because you could stretch the Roth IRA over the life expectancy of the beneficiaries, the non right. beneficiaries. But post-secure, what we found was we would bifurcate the Roth conversion and say, look, it, if we've got insurability, how about instead, if we know we're going to pull $100,000 out of the IRA and we know that we've got all of our income plans covered, and you got to have a strong income plan to do this. If we've got all of our income needs covered with a shared income or close to it, and we know this is surplus money, and we can use any type of calculation engine that we, we employ that demonstrates that this is really going to be the nucleus of a legacy. 
if it's going to be part of a legacy, why not leverage the legacy? And so we bifurcate that and we'll typically look at splitting that into maybe a GUL policy um, or a, a, a policy that has hybrid life features that creates a little bit more liquid, assured liquidity sooner. And so by doing that, instead of just taking 100,000 from an IRA and moving it to 100,000 where they own 100,000 the Roth, you might be able to take 10,000 and leverage that up to another $100,000 death benefit. <clears throat> and so the whole idea here is if we can leverage it up to a death benefit, now we've got levelized planning and we could never do that just by doing straight Roth conversions. And since that barrier, that lifetime stretch of the Roth has now been robbed of our from our planning toolbox, the difference between life insurance death benefits and um, the Roth distributions is so tight that a lot of times the life insurance leverage goes much further. Plus, in life insurance policies, we found better leveraging than we can assure with a portfolio design. And beyond that is we're very concerned about the, the acts like Bernie Sanders' proposal, the 98.5% act. If that were to go through, and I, and I don't want to be bringing bells and jumping and screaming alarms because I don't think that in itself will ever see the light of day. But the fact is, we're looking at lower exemptions, 3.5. Even if nothing changes in 2025, it can be somewhere around five when TCJ expires. And so if we do a bifurcated Roth conversion, it would be easy to transfer that life insurance portion into an irrevocable trust and get it out of the estate if we see an estate exemption that comes back. We can't do that with a Roth. We never can move that Roth out of the estate. It's going to be part of it, but we can move the insurance policy out. And right. so it leaves more planning options for the clients. And if it's anticipated, they're going to cross over 10 million with, uh, you know, looking over at the new limits that would happen after TCJ. If they're going to cross over 10 million, even though that today we can look at 23, we would immediately look to bifurcating and doing a, an island. Because that way we're assured that that nucleus, that legacy portion is going to escape the estate tax. Yeah, that's great. Good insights. Great. Shifting gears a moment. Looking at where you're at within the practice today, you know, president and co-founder of Platinum Wealth, I know we could touch a little bit on Advanced Planning Educational Group, which you also helped co-found. Uh, but when you look at the practice today and, and kind of the journey that you're setting yourself upon here going forward, what would your true vision of a legacy look like? For Platinum? For Platinum. Um it's, it's, and then just you, you as as you as a planner as well, because part of that is being a natural student. Yep. Uh, you've certainly adopted as a as a child, if you will, or birthed another child, and that is APEG. And I know that that's near and dear to your heart as well. Uh, and so I think that's the big picture legacy. But if you can kind of talk a little bit more about that, <laughs> well, first things first is uh, I look at the, you know it's I I know that you strongly believe in having a deep purpose in what you do, Scott. And, mm -hmm. and I know that we share that same vision. And I ha and my purpose is real clear. I was blessed with my first child 11 years ago. His name's David. And I have two, since then I have two twins and Andrew and Sarah, and they're both six right now. My dream would be that one or more of my three children would want to follow in my footsteps and someday assume a portion of Platinum Wealth Management. And I'm also respectful that I brought in two young gentlemen that joined my firm and, and part of my own succession planning that will have rights to our book of business by all means. They've earned it. And I'm not going to be that person that has a right hand person while I'm alive. And then they always know their place holding it for my kids. No, my kids will have to earn their place. And, and I want everybody that's ever worked with me to know that their rewards are their rewards. But one of the things I want to change for my kids and my legacy to this industry, and that's where Apex's birth really stemmed from, is when I started off, everybody viewed me as a salesperson. I'd go out to a house and no matter how well educated, you can look at all the letters next to my name. I'm a, for gosh sakes, I'm a college professor. And no matter what. But what you're I'm here to sell me something. Yeah, I'm here to sell you something. I'm a salesperson. And what stinks about that is, I am probably more well-versed than most in the financial service industry. Not everybody. I know there's a lot of great talent out there, but I hate being a salesperson and I don't want my kids with that connotation next to their name because they want to take a role in the financial services industry. Yeah. So my goal is to participate in a Vanguard movement, not the firm, um, but be part of a Vanguard movement to change the perception of financial services 
that the financial service professional get the due credit that we deserve. If we're helping families, we help families far better than most of the other professionals. A CPA really meets with a client for a few minutes, types in some numbers, their tax return is done. And then April 16th, they're in their beach house in Malibu. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the attorney's in and out of there once every 18 years. We see these people two, three, four times a year. We have significant impact. We make sure that they have a living income. We make sure that their estate plan's done. I want credit for that. And I want my kids to have the credit. So if you want to know what my legacy is going to be, if I can have any influence to help elevate our industry so that we get the respect that we really deserve, because by and large as an industry, we're doing a great job for the families we serve. So this is a serious question. You have a practice, financial wealth management practice. You help to develop and grow APEG. You're a father of three, a husband. You teach the CFP curriculum at Oakland University. I'm serious. How do you manage your time? How do you how do you figure this out? Um, well, and, and also I, na I I lecture nationally where I'm in the air pre COVID um, in the month of February right before COVID struck. Uh, as a matter of fact, my last day was visiting you, Scott. It was my last air trip. February yeah, 28th, I remember, I remember flying out, catching a red eye out of uh, LAX. Like, yeah, after after Tahoe and a bunch of meetings that we were presenting yeah. around Southern California as well. Well, I remember driving by the coast. I was heading up to LAX, and all the freighters were out trapped in the ocean because they weren't letting them come into port because that came in from China. And it was like a, just a sea of freighters. They're but, still out there. So that's a big problem. Logistically, you've got miles and miles of of, of tankers sitting out on the coast of long beach in la and we're hearing like some of them are taking three or four months before they're allowed on shore to unload it's a real real challenge well i saw the first couple of days they were blocking them from port and it was bad then but i can only imagine now but um yeah. i remember um you know that month of february i was in 11 cities um and so as far as time management goes and i also own a tax and accounting firm too I have learned one, trust the people around me. Financial, financial planning for my financial planning firm. The one thing that I, the one decision I made that was a really difficult call was when I looked at Don and Greg, my two co-founders and the other people that um, I have brought on board is we do a ton of split case work where we share in the compensation equally. So whereas I will, um, help to develop new relationships. I evaluate all the new relationships are the, the, the leadership team brings on the firm into the firm. I evaluate the merits of them. I do the macro planning with them, but we inform the clients that I'm only there for the macro planning and I share the responsibility and the compensation e compensation equally with my partners. And as a result, the, I need to make my RMD. I need to do an annuity reallocation. I need to do my portfolio rebalancing, all of that falls onto my team members. And so we all share it. We share in the work. We have different responsibilities, but that frees me up to do APEC. And, and so it's a matter of intelligently using the people around you, trusting the people around you. I don't have contracts. When people work for my firm, I, I had one of my colleagues that joined us uh, early on in the first year we set up Platinum, came from the mutual fund family, first investors. His name's Peter, and he is a great guy. Peter came to us a few years ago and says, you know, you don't have me under contract for anything. I said, I don't need a contract. And he said, why? And I said, are you ever going to leave? He says, never. I said, that's why I don't need a contract. I said, my keeping you here and keeping you happy is my business solution. Paper is only used if you're not going to do the right thing. But if you right. do the right thing and you look at the people you surround yourself with, you treat people fairly, you don't over, you don't overtake in compensation. You're very fair. <clears throat> um, you allow them to own I own opportunities. When uh, one of the younger people works a case that I have given them, maybe I take a relationship that's smaller than I might service. And I say, all right, Mark, here, you take it on. My deal with them, as long as you stay here for five years, you actually own that relationship. I no longer own it. And so instead of trying to fight to keep all the relationships mine, I share them. And by sharing them, nobody leaves. People don't want to leave because they're happy. And so the secret to my success in time management is trusting the people around me sharing the responsibilities, clearly delineating where the responsibilities start and end, and then just pull your fair weight in that agreement. But the thing you have to recognize is, no, you're not going to keep 100% of the compensation. 
Right. When I do a three-way case with my partners, I'm getting a third. And it sure would be nice to hire salaried people and say, I'm going to give you, a, you know, $50,000 a year base salary and I'll keep all the compensation. I would do much better. The problem is salary people come and go. But when they're and when they own a third of that relationship, nobody's leaving. Yeah. That's great insights. Um, so talk a little bit about, I think we expand a little bit on APEG and some of the resources that are available to there. Uh, well, to the website and to the resources that you all have. Well, if you remember my remember my first sentence about um, my first day in the field and what I was afraid of when I walked in to see a client, and they probably knew more than <laughs> I did. And oh my gosh, I was like a kid in a gardener going out, getting kicked out of mom's car that first day, you know, that slow walk to the door. <laughs> yeah. More like a shuffle. And as soon as the car drove away, you know, you're crying, please don't leave. But um. so that's the why, right? I mean, that's the why APEG. And, and so, and, and all the resources we developed are around that. There's yeah. two things that, that we believe in that. And I believe that everyone needs to be educated in the financial service industry. We need to know our craft. It means we need to be educated in the five segments of planning. Even if we only engage in one of them, we need to know what the other segments do, because that way we can at least convey that we're considerate of that in our recommendations. Mm. So we have to be educated. Ed, getting educated means that we've taken a foundations course like APEG offers, or I've gone for my CFP which APEG offers, any of those are the educated pieces because that education is static. And, you know, there's only so much to know about a power of attorney for financial decisions. It's the same document it's been for the last, you know, 300 years. It's a power of attorney for financial decisions. Yes, it's had evolution components, but it's still the same thing. Then there's being informed. As an advisor, we need to be informed. And by being informed, it means that we're staying abreast of current topics or topics that don't land in every household's lap. Um, special needs planning is being informed. Being informed about what are the modern techniques in planning around a special needs circumstance is important. Being informed, as an advisor, I've seen a tremendous uptick in people buying vacation homes because post-COVID, most of us get to work from home now. Most white collar jobs are working from home. So why does home have to be in a suburb? Why can't it be in a house on Lake Michigan? Why can't it be in somewhere nice, you know, looking there? And so I've seen clients have been calling me up saying, hey, look at, I want to pull a half a million dollars out of my AUM account because I'm buying a house and literally this happening is going to Texas. And right. uh, I said, okay, so he's going to buy in Texas. And I said, all right, great. You can afford the half a million, but can you afford the extra 40, 50,000 a year to maintain a second house? And so well, being informed is knowing what questions to ask, how to run it through a calculator. To it's determine interesting to me. Pause there for a moment. Do you think the client, just individuals at large process that, you know, the implications of investing or purchasing a second home. I mean, they see uh, the step one is, do I have enough assets to make the down payment from there? What's their thought process be beyond that? I mean, <laughs> well, you know, from experience, how are they really walking through? Okay. I've got to live now and maintain two properties, not to mention the time suck. Yeah. Scarcity that- of time is dramatic for everybody right now. And that's exactly it. Well, the problem is the clients are short. Many times the clients are so excited and the exuberance of having that house that looks at the water being in Texas, looking at a cactus. I mean, Uh anyway, you (laughs) it's that exuberance of getting the house that shuts their brain down to think about what is the long term implications? Because the other question that we as planners need to remind them, say, look at. If you're getting a vacation home, you're going to find out you have friends, more friends than you ever knew. I didn't have a single friend in high school. Now I have a beach house and all of a sudden everybody wants to be my bestie. And, um, you know, the same kids that were putting me in a locker now want to come spend time on my beach. (laughs) But, you know, it's funny how life works that way. Yeah. I always, I always tell my daughter now. I I joke. I tell my daughter, make sure you're nicest to the biggest nerd in class. One day you might want to marry him. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so when he owns Microsoft. Um, so when, when what I look at here is we as planners need to have tools, techniques to be able to tell the clients, all right, hey, let's talk about the purchase. Yeah, we'll come up with the downstroke. Can you afford the monthly payment? Yeah, you got that one covered. But could that payment survive retirement? Because our income plan didn't contemplate $30,000 of payments a year or $20,000 of payment. And by the way, when you get a vacation home, what goes along with vacation home is when you have two houses, you now have two jars of mayonnaise you buy because they both go bad at the same time. You have all the staple items. And then when you have company, you'll want to show them a good time. You're going to want to take them golfing. So you'll probably join a golf course. 
a golf club. You might say, hey, look it, I'm going to cook them dinner. I'm not going to make them franks and beans. I'm going to go ahead and buy some filet. So where you might even eat a New York strip on your on a Tuesday night. Yeah, tomahawk, got, maybe. Yeah, you're going to have company. You're going to open up and you're going to put out a steak on that grill. Or you're going to smoke something really cool. And, it and, wh- and what do you need with a good steak? Oh, you, you got to have a bottle of wine. A great bottle of wine because you want to look impressive because they're sitting right. at your beach house. So you can't pull out the Boone's Farm and unscrew the cap. <laughs> <laughs> Although, by the way, Boone's Farm is great. Uh, that's not a negative of a comment to Boone's Farm. Please don't sue me, Boone's Farm. <laughs> we're, we're just having fun. Yeah, Talk I think Boone's Farm is responsible for my oldest son. But um, anyway, so um, when it comes down to it, it's being informed about things like that. Right now, rental property, anybody who's got investment property, it's being informed that 2021 could be the last great year to have an exit strategy if the new tax laws come into play or any form thereof. of them. And so this is where... Being educated is important, but being informed is equally as important. So that way you can segregate your book of business. You can start to say, these are my clients with investment properties. I'm going to go and set up just kind of a a meeting. And it's a good reason to have a conversation. I'm going to do this. Or maybe I'll hold a small group event where I'll do a little seminar on talking points. And by the way, real investment real estate owners are usually friends with other investment real estate owners. A good reason to throw out there an invitation to you and your friends. I'm going to talk about some of the things we should be thinking about this, this next six months. Mm-hmm. And so, Scott, to your point, what does APEC do? We have the education to make sure you know what you need to know, the foundational knowledge. And then we have the information. And that was what's so important to me is because being informed on the newest topics and planning techniques means I've got a competitive advantage over anybody else in my marketplace. Because... I can walk into a vacation community and say, let's talk about the pitfalls of estate planning with that vacation home. And so that really boy, that really comes in handy. It's, st- it's, k- it's staying informed that really pays off. To look firsthand domain, website domain with Producers Choice, where do they go? For our website domain? Yes, APEG. APEGcommunity.com. And if they're tied with Producers Choice, just scroll down under all offerings to you'll see the Producers Choice logo. And then there's a Producers Choice platform that um, Scott's company has um, bought down for producer's choice um, users. One to three books that I should read this summer. Well, Anything. you are a natural student. You got to have a book that you can share with me, whether it's whether it's financially related or not. Well, the first thing is I, I'm a huge fan. If you're going to pick three books, I'm a huge fan of reading anything that's going to benefit your relationship with a client. I would go one, two, and three, everything that Tom Hagnes put out. <laughs> okay. So paychecks and playchecks and all that do all yeah, that. And, and those are that is one, two, and three. And the interesting thing is, I, I actually went out and bought um about 20 copies of paychecks and playchecks. And I leave them under my desk or I leave them with me. And what I do is I will say to a client, listen, next time we meet, we're gonna be talking about your income plan. I want you to read through this. It's a coffee table book, you can grind through it in a, a couple, three hours. It's nothing big. And I said a lot of pictures. I said, I don't believe in everything that Tom says. I'm not a fan of everything Tom says. I want to be absolutely clear. But there are some concepts in here that I think are going to resonate with your plan. And they're definitely going to be a component of our conversation. So between now and when we talk in complaining, just take a read of this. Even if you skim it. And when you're done, give me the book back. Or just look at all the pictures and then read the the content underneath the pictures. That'll give you some basic insight. So yeah, give me, and then when you're done, give me the book back because I want to reuse it. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm a library owning it out. You're going to return this or you're going to get state penalties. Yes. Because I'm going to, if I invite Scott to my beach house, I want to buy him a tomahawk. And if I got to keep buying new books, <laughs> I'll bring the wine. All right. I'll buy the steaks. We're, we're in the middle of cow country. We have a dairy farm right down the road where we buy all of our fresh meat from. We will break bread. At your lake house, one of these days, I promise you that. Thank you so much for joining us today. This was very insightful, some great conversation, not only just about platinum wealth, but also specific planning strategies. Jeff Henley, my good friend. It's a pleasure, Scott. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you in person again real soon. Oh, goodness, yes. I look forward to that. All right. Take care, buddy. Bye-bye.